I would like to start our story with that picture. You know, most of the stories about Bangladesh is about water. It's a country, at some point of the year, 75% of the country goes under the water. And that's a very natural thing for it to happen. The entire Himalayan water resource passes through Bangladesh. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting data uh, that Bangladesh has more fresh water than the entire United States does because of all the water is passing through the country. So this picture is, I just saw it uh, 10, 15 years ago. I was passing by the country, and I saw that uh, people are crossing the river. This mighty river, this, this river sometime during the rainy season of the year, it's like almost six, seven miles in width. And without any life jacket, without nothing, and a storm was brewing. But it just, it just made me see that how solution Providers should be working. They should be simply coming up with a solution. They should be thinking about the life jacket. They should think about how to navigate the boat. Customers don't care much about these things. So anything we do uh, when we design a product, I think the solution provider, solution developer, should be thinking about all this other reality. And this picture, picture is just a, just a reality check that uh, uh, many of the solutions were not probably designed properly. So I need the... Uh, so that's just the introductory page. The story begins from here with this fisherman. So back in 2004, I was a graduate student. I went to Bangladesh. Uh, I was crossing a river, and this fisherman approached me with a fish, and he says that... Um, you know, do you want to buy this fish? And I, I, was a, I, was, I was alone living, and I was leaving Bangladesh in a few days. So there's no way I could... First of all, I couldn't afford buying a fish like that. Second, it was uh, too big. So I said that, no, it's fine. And he comes back in half an hour, reducing the price by 20%. He says, do you want to buy, you know, 4,000? And I said, no, I'm not interested. He comes back again an hour later. He said... What about 2,000? And that intrigued me. And I said, like, why are you self-negotiating? And he said, well, you know, after, after 6 o'clock, when the sun goes down, I, this fish will rot. There's no one to buy. And I, I was quite intrigued. And when he was doing this thing, he was constantly making phone calls. You know, one of those Nokia $15 handset um, that, that, that survives forever, OK? So he was constantly talking about this phone. And, and I knew one simple thing, that, that a phone like that has more processing power than what, what NASA used in 1969 when man went to moon. So I, was, I was basically had that question, that why will his fish rot when, when he has a NASA computer in his pocket? Okay. So, so I started looking into this deeper, like what can you do about this thing? So let's look at this phone. So he had that handset, it's his hand. And they buy this handset, $15, and they spend $1 to buy the string so the phone doesn't get lost. And there's also, it has a waterproofing, like a jacket around it, okay? It's very similar to what our grandparents used to use by, uh, when they buy, when they used to have the pocket watch, okay? So fundamentally, pocket watch is an expensive tool in Europe and America. People didn't want to lose this thing, so they wanted to have a string around it. And this guy spent $15 buying a handset. He didn't want to also lose this handset, okay? Very similar, and these kind of handsets are perhaps the most democratically distributed tool in the history of mankind, okay? I have seen uh, some very powerful people. I actually saw one time um, Vice President Al Gore having a phone exactly of this kind, okay? It's like, my God. Al Gore's phone and that guy's phone is the same phone. I mean, there must be some other way to take care of this thing. I mean, do something out of this thing. So here was the simple statistics, a uh, sim simple way of seeing this thing. So there was 100 million of such phones. If we can create a system where you can, like create an eBay or like Craigslist type thing, where he will put his item and somebody will see it, somebody will buy it, somebody will give him a call, and let's be very, very conservative, like 1% of those people, um, of 100 million, I'd say fishermen, 
So we have one million fishermen with, with phones today. And be even more conservative than whatever I just said, that idea will be adopted by 1% of the people. So then every day, we're going to have 10,000 fish available in the market. So with that idea, after grad school, I said, let's start a company. And when I started that classified business based on mobile phone, I saw somebody posted a tanker, someone posted a German Shepherd dog, someone posted red chili. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, within like four and a half years before we... So one day, a big telephone company uh, acquired that company. Well, that's good. That, that paid for my many things. Okay. So I was trying to say, hey, what else can we do out of this thing? But while I was doing this, this telephone idea, this market idea, what I noticed that Bangladesh as a country is a country of 165 million people. Its economy size is around 200 billion. Uh, it's the 35th largest economy. Everybody's making very small amount of money, but because the population is very big, it's a very big economy. Okay? But there's only 800,000 plastics in the whole country. So there was no payment mechanism. So now 60% of the population had mobile phone. Only 15% have uh, banking. So if somehow something could be developed, then these people could be also part of the banking system. Okay. So with that idea, uh, Bragg Bank and Money in Motion. Bragg Bank requires not much introduction, but I'll still give it a little introduction. Bragg is the largest developing agency in the world. They has a uh, commercial bank in Bangladesh. Money in Motion requires a little introduction. Money in Motion is a bunch of entrepreneurs. Uh, former CFO of T-Mobile, myself, founder of a large telephone company, and also the person who conceptualized the idea of mobile money. Four of us created this company called Money in Motion. And Money in Motion and Bragg Bank together created Bcash. And Bcash then started putting together human ATMs like that all over the country. I'm not getting into the complexity, but these are like human ATM where you can give physical cash and they will give you electronic money back. And that company started growing. Uh, IFC, International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group, and later Gates Foundation also made an investment in this company. Okay. And now, after, after almost five years, we have 130,000 human ATMs all over the country. We have 23 million registered users. And Bikash became a Bengali verb. So people say, Bikash me. That means send me money. Just to give you a sense of idea, how, how, what's the traction level, we move around $18 billion in a year right now. And all small tickets. Uh, our transaction volume is around, around uh, put together Square and few other companies. I think we're much bigger than them. We just happen to be in Bangladesh. Okay. Um, now, let's look at what's happening. Impact-wise, what, what is it creating? So this woman, let's imagine her. She's a textile worker. She gets her salary. And she, when she gets her salary, she most likely she gives the money to her husband or father or brother for some kind of safekeeping. When she does that, they're also good people. They don't waste the money. But most likely, they will use that for a productive activity, making an investment. So now, having a Bcash account, she has access to her money anytime she wants. She can go to one of these human ATM. He can, she can withdraw money. She can put the money. She has a saving platform. And this is something I don't have any empirical data behind it, but simply my hunch that when saving starts, 
That's when the prosperity begins. Because you start thinking about a future day. You don't think about immediate, immediate need of tomorrow. So she, today she has a saving platform as well. Without the saving platform, where do people put money? People put money under the mattress. So now Bikash platform has become the collective mattress for the whole, whole country, for poor people. Uh, this picture, the reason I find it fascinating, I was driving by and I saw this small shop, Bikash Agent Point, in a rural neighborhood. So, and I saw there's a rickshaw coming next to it. And I thought, that's quite interesting. Rickshaw remained where it was 100 years ago, but the financial service has moved really far beyond. And thanks to this technology, that's, 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 we're going through an unpre unprecedented time where this kind of technology can really, uh, by, as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's, an, it's a, perhaps the most democratized tool in the history of mankind. So people can act, take part of this, this, this technology in a seamless way. People can send money from Amsterdam to Bangladesh in a second. Okay? Uh, it is going to pass through many different layers, but the money will reach exactly where it needs to reach within, within a second. Uh, now, let's talk about a little bit, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to talk about a little bit of a macroeconomic impact that's happening. So let's imagine he's sending money to his family in the village. He sends 5,000 taka. She withdraws 4,000 taka. And 1,000 taka stays in the system. And when millions of people does this thing, and everybody keeps $1, $2, 50 cents, 30 cents, it creates a large pool of cash. And that large pool of cash, when you put together, it creates a large volume of capital resource that can be utilized for other activity. I mean, it's a very common idea that middle class will save and the industrialists will be building industry out of this thing. But these very basic tools today is contributing for the very poor people in putting together a large volume of capital resource. Bikash today holds close to $200 million of float of all everybody's one penny, two penny coming together. And if we keep, if we have generated that kind of money in, 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 in last five years, uh, I see in next 10 years, this number is going to be only bigger. So then think about this thing. Somebody is building a very sophisticated car manufacturing company, but actually the capital is coming from a very small little worker somewhere in the world. And that is, I think, is a very powerful, powerful, powerful new tool the world has today for financial activities. Now, I want to, before, before finishing, I want to tell you a little bit uh, of a personal story. Do you see anything beyond this thing? I, I, I see something here, I don't know. Can you see the mountain in the blue sky? Okay. Huh, I, I see a little bit, but that was the idea. A very thin line of mountain should be there somewhere. Okay. The idea is Bangladesh is, is a plain country. It's a flat plain. Uh, it's a country as big as Wisconsin. It has half of the US population. Okay. And people are all relatively well fed. Okay. We grow four crops a year. But how does it work? It's basically entire Himalayan water resource passes through the country. And that makes the country very fertile. But I have never, when I lived in Bangladesh, I left when I was 17. When I lived there, I have never seen the mountain. Okay? Uh, because it's a very humid country, a lot of mist. But at one point, I went to a corner of the country in January in the very early morning. I saw the glimpse of the of the mountain, I mean, so you cannot see it here. It's so, so thin. But actually the mountain is very close. If the sky is clear, you will see the mountain like this. It's just 200 miles away, straight from, from Bangladesh, okay? Now everywhere, every day from that mountain, one drop at a time is trickling down. It creates the glacier, creates the river, and within 100 miles, the river turns into a massive water flow, the small rivers putting together. And that big river, it, it brings the silt, it nourishes the land, and that's where you grow food for 
165 million people, and, and people get all live in, in good harmony. So it's a little bit like that, that one drop at a time, the big, big pool of water is created eventually, and that creates the ecosystem. And to me, as a practitioner, financial inclusion is like that. One drop at a time from one person, and within, within, within five years, sorry, yeah, within five years, that one drop, two drop becomes $200 million. And, and if we see it that way, then all the challenges we are seeing in the world today can be all addressed, okay? It's just figuring it out. It's like going back to, going back to my fisherman, who had nothing but a $15 handset. Here, you don't have much besides that one drop at a time, okay? But putting it together, it creates a meaningful, meaningful force. So, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I saw this man, and, and it's a lovely, lovely shot. I know, I mean, he was speaking water lily. <laughs> After all, the brain power is very democratically distributed, like the handsets, okay? If you, it all depends how you utilize this thing. Thank you very much. Thanks.